all kind of really nerdy people, I can tell you that up front. And so you're gonna see a lot of plots that you've seen before, a lot of, you know, kind of these survival curves. So I'm gonna try to kind of walk you through these. Um, but as, as I was preparing this um, talk, I actually realized that I was actually writing, you know, March 7th, and I couldn't, I couldn't pass the pun. So we're gonna work up to talk this morning about the march towards the cure. Now I was left to, left to be the end, um, you know, to, to the end to discuss this with you. But I have to say, while my talk is about advanced disease, I have to tell you that actually what I'm going to be talking to you about today is some of the most exciting developments we've seen in melanoma in the last five years. And the hope that as time moves on, those advances will actually be brought earlier and earlier so that, as Dr. Kirk would explain to you, for those patients that we can't cure surgically, we'll hopefully be able to cure adjuvantly. So, John being my mentor, I'm gonna, I, we steal slides back and forth, so you're gonna see kind of some common slides here, but I think this kind of brings you back to the idea that, you know, this is kind of the spectrum of the disease that we deal with. You've heard from doctors um, Ferris and, and Dr. Holtzman about this part. You've heard about adjuvant therapy from John, and I'm gonna explain to you a little bit about what we're doing when the disease kind of passes all these limits and finally ends up, unfortunately, you know, spreading through the, body, I'll spend some time explaining some of the advances for disease all over the body, but as you well know, it's very important also to focus on brain metastases when it goes to that kind of final frontier. So we'll talk about this a little bit as well. So, you know, taking you back a few years ago, um, I can, I can sh tell you that, you know, I started treating this disease over 10 years ago already. and, and at that time, it was, it was very, every paper I wrote, every discussion I had with a, with a patient and every grant I wrote started always with this kind of awful sentence that this is a disease that, you know, is uniformly fatal once it's metastatic. You know, those 10,000 patients a year that get metastatic disease, the mortality is about 8,000 a year. Um, so that can tell you how difficult that disease was to treat. Uh, we always said that response, the, the, the overall survival is about six to nine months. But that was the past. And the past is represented in this slide, just to show you, this is an exercise that Dr. Kirkwood and the NCI group did together, in which they reviewed all of the 30 years of clinical trials that have been done through the National Cancer Institute, with 72 different approaches to therapy over 30 years. And basically, just to make it very simple, every one of those blue dots is actually a treatment modality, you know, one arm of a trial. And anything that you find outside of these blue lines is an effective therapy. How many do you see? When it comes to overall survival, essentially none. When you go to progression-free survival, which I'll explain a little later, there was only one that was considered a positive study, which is actually even less than you would expect to find even by chance alone. That's how the disease looked like only five, six years ago. And it was kind of an area of therapeutic nihilism. And, you know, pharmaceutical companies were really not willing to bring their drugs to melanoma because, well, if you tried it 70 times and you got only one positive arm, maybe you don't want to try it the next time. Well, that was the past again. And what we're going to talk about today is all of the changes that happened since then. So since the 1970s up until about 2010, the one-year overall survival for metastatic melanoma was 25%. And within a few years, we've had anti-CTLA-4, which I'll tell you about a little more, BRAF inhibitors, and essentially, automatically, immediately, with one agent, it was doubling of the overall survival at one year, doubling of the overall survival at two years. With BRAF inhibitors, again, it was almost doubling, if not more, of the one year overall survival. And that is already a bit of the past, only two years ago, because now we have even things that work even better. So these single agents of PDL1, Pembro, and Nevo are already getting the one year overall survival at 63, 70%. And then when you combine these things together, you're already hitting 80, 83%. So I was talking to one of the patient caregivers today, I was saying that 10 years ago, when we meet patients in our office, we would really dance around the word cure and almost not want to mention it. And now I think we're not bashful about it at all. You're going to hear it the first time we meet you because we think we're getting so much closer. 
So, you know, to, 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 with all of that, this is what you've seen also from Dr. Kirkwood, that, you know, when we had only decarbazine, interferon, and interleukin, now we have seven new drugs that were just approved in the last four years. And those new drugs are what we're going to go through together. So, well, how did this happen? You know, did melanoma doctors just wake up one day and become a whole lot smarter? Like, how did we get to this point in such a short time? You know, the reality is it's not a short time. The reality is it took many, many, many years to really try to understand what are the underpinnings of how the melanoma cell works and then understanding how the immune system fails to kill it early. Those two brought together is really what helped. So we knew a lot of things about melanoma. We knew that it starts, this is a melanocyte. We knew it starts in the skin. We knew that sunlight was the major ingredient. We knew that UV radiation was the major ingredient, that it induces DNA damage, and by inducing DNA damage, it leads to mutations, and those mutations accumulate over time, and that leads to melanoma. In fact, you know, if you look at uh, mutation, mutational spectra, there's something called the UV signature that's present in, in melanoma in terms of mutations. And we also knew that that actually correlated with the slow progression of the tumor. So if you look at the earliest of the benign nevus that's not even full-blown, you know, even starting the malignant transformation, you already find some mutations. And the BRAF mutation is one we'll talk about a lot today. But you already find BRAF mutations early on, actually more commonly than even in, in, in actual malignant disease. So you start with that mutation, and then other things start happening. This is a disease that's very genomically unstable. It's incapable of actually um, repairing the DNA damage that's induced by UV radiation. And as you start accumulating other things, like P10 loss is one of the genes that are very important, then the malignant transformation starts. And all I want you to see is as you go from here to invasive melanoma, to melanoma that's even more capable of going to, to the vasculature, just look down here and look just at the number of changes that exist. You know, obviously you don't need to, need to know any of those specifics, but the fact that by the time you get here, you know, there's a whole bunch of changes that already have happened in the tumor. So as we understood these, that took 20, 30 years from the late 80s all the way until, you know, the, the early 2000s until we actually started really understanding what these mutations do and how they act. And so what we're going to talk about today is, again, the tumor cell. This is the tumor cell itself. And what really drives it all the way from the cell surface where, you know, it gets signals from other things that normally tells it to grow. And then usually it doesn't grow except if it sees the signal from the outside. When that receptor gets mutated, it actually starts firing off as if the signal is there when it's not. And that's basically the start of the malignant transformation. That can happen at the cell surface with CKIT, as Dr. Kirkwood told you. That's relatively uncommon, but it also happens below the surface of the cell, kind of between the, the, the cell um, membrane and kind of the, the proteins that are right underneath that take that signal and slowly kind of pass it along until it goes to the nucleus and tells the, the DNA to start replicating and the cell to actually start dividing. So when you get a mutation in any of those, we talked about BRAF, uh, NRAS is about 20% of all patients. When you get a mutation, that again activates the signal even though activates the, the cell, even though there is no signal from the outside telling it to do anything. That's what makes it cancerous. And we like to call it, the nerdy people we are, an oncogenic driver, because it, it basically starts the cancer and drives the cancer. As we learned about that process, we also should not forget that a lot of work has been done in melanoma and trying to understand why does the immune system turn the blind eye? Why the immune system sees a cell that's becoming crazy and proliferating and it's not supposed to do all of this stuff, but then comes over, looks at it, turns the blind eye and, and go away. So those were basically really excellent understandings of these two mechanisms that help us make all these progress. So let's start with the BRAF. So you've heard about how BRAF mutation is very common. It's about 40 to 50% of all patients with melanoma. And that mutation is a very specific mutation. It's just one base pair that gets switched. Instead of being V, it's E. And that's just an amino acid that basically makes that protein, instead of waiting for that signal again, just start turning on its own. 
and that leads to activation of things that are downstream from it and cell replication. So if we know what the driver is, all we really need to do is to stop the driver, right? Sounds pretty simple. Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. So we knew since 2002 was the first time this was described. It took a couple of years until people understood exactly what it does. Uh, but we knew that it would be really nice if we can target it because maybe that's how it would be killing the cancer cell. Well, at the time, we looked around and said, what are the drugs that are available that can actually target this? And lo and behold, there was this drug called sorafenib, which, you know, you'll hear these weird n names, but essentially it's a RAF inhibitor. So it's a sorafenib inhibitor. And so people looked at it and said, okay, that would be really good. We know that it actually inhibits BRAF, and so we should try it. And that took basically 800 patients at ECOG and about 300 patients in, in a different setting where that drug was added to chemotherapy with the hope that, you know, chemotherapy has some effectiveness on its own. If we add it to chemotherapy, we may be able to induce even better responses, better control of tumor. And after three, four years of basically the entire melanoma field being gripped by this, when you see these survival curves, you can tell that those two things were superimposed. These were chemo versus chemo plus that drug kind of nothing happened. Um, this is the first time I show you a survival curve, so let's go over it for just a tiny minute so that you guys understand all the other survival curves you're gonna see. Basically, a survival curve starts at zero, and here's zero time, so on this axis there's time, and here there's 100% of patients. You start with all the patients, everybody being there at time zero, 100%. As time goes, you know, some patients experience events. Sometimes it's progression, and we call that progression-free survival, and sometimes death. And when, when an event happens, that curve drops down, and it keeps dropping with more deaths recorded, right? So when we look at these curves, you know, that gives us a sense of how long does it take for half the patients to die, and we call that the median overall survival. Um, so in this situation, basically, serafinib didn't work. So a lot of people looked at this and said, you know, this is really bad. This targeted therapy, yeah, may not really be the actual answer for melanoma. Well, but the issue is, serafinib was just actually a bad drug. In fact, now we call the whole class of these drugs that are similar to serafinib, we call them dirty inhibitors because they're not very specific. They don't go after just the one protein. They inhibit a bunch of things. In fact, they inhibit, inhibit BRAF if it's mutated or even if it's not mutated. They inhibit CRAF as well. They inhibit a bunch of things. So there was this company called Plexicon that said, well, we know that this BRAF protein is different, the, the mutated one is different than the one that's not mutated. So can we make a drug that just inhibits that mutated form? Nothing else. We just want to inhibit that one mutated form. And they came up with a drug called uh, Plex Plexicon 4032 and basically tried it on cells. So I told you that if this is activated, then you would have this ERK activated cyclin, and this K67 is a measure of cell proliferation. This is in patient tissues. The brown is that phosphorylated ERK, activated ERK. Cyclin is, is a part of the cell cycle, and this tells you that all of these dark brown cells are actually actively dividing, okay? So you gave that drug, and this is what happened. The brown went away, the brown went away, no more cells dividing. So that actually worked. It really did completely block that pathway and stopped the progression or the, the, the cell division of the tumor. So how did that ha work in patients? This is what I'm showing you. This is how it looked like in patients. So this is a PET scan. Some of you mentioned it earlier today. Um, all of these things you see here, all of this is tumor. This is the brain, so that's expected to do that. Here you see this is the heart, so the black you see on the right is actually physiologic uptake, but everything black you see on this side is metastatic melanoma. And that's what we mean when we say it's all over the place. And two weeks later, that's how the PET scan looked. Almost complete quenching of all of the PET activity. Um, and that, you know, translated into tumor shrinking down pretty dramatically as well. So this is, you know, a patient with lung, liver, even bone lesions, and eight weeks later, you know, these are the lesions here. You see the liver lesions, pretty large ones here. Eight weeks later, pretty much gone. So that was 
truly unheard of melanoma. And Plexicon 4032 um, was later named soon after Vemurafenib, which is actually V600E mutated RAF inhibitor. So Vemurafenib, basically to, to, to say that this was a specific inhibitor to a specific drug, and this is how it looked like in a lot of patients, because I showed you one, this is basically what we call a waterfall plot. And what this really means is this is the amount of tumor at zero time. So if the, if the tumor doesn't change at all, that's 0% change. Every bar is a patient's tumor burden change. It's the change of the tumor burden in one patient. So if you have something that's above zero, that means the tumor grew. If you have something that's below zero, that means the tumor shrunk down. And so, thankfully, you see 80% of patients or so will have this decrease in the amount of tumor, you know, shrinkage. And once they cross that threshold that we have here, we call it an objective response. So when you hear a response rate, that actually tells you the percent of patients that are beyond that threshold. That's what a response rate really means. So 80% of patients had some shrinkage, and about half of them actually had what we call objective response. Again, unheard of, decarbazine, carbotaxel, interleukin-2, response rates 10%, 12%, completely unheard of. And, you know, when we see this in early phase trials, most people look at it and say, wait until you get to phase 3, because that's where all of these responses will go away. Meaning that, you know, if you treat 10 patients and you're lucky enough, you might see 8 patients responding. If you treat 1,000, you might end up finding only 5 of them responding, or 500. But that was not the case. In fact, that, that impressive response, impressive activity in 80% of patients went all the way through to phase three trials because we found a drug that was hitting the right target that was actually doing its job, and that was really impressive. So these are obviously each, each uh, plot, each uh, you know, uh, bar here is a patient again. So that's hundreds of patients on BRIM3, hundreds of patients on BREAK3, which is the second drug called Dubrafenib. And so with that, we have kind of made the first dent in terms of targeted therapy of melanoma. We knew the driver, we got the drug, we got the responses. Um, and this is how it looked when you compared it to chemotherapy. So this is progression-free survival. Again, anytime you look at these survival curves, being up is a very good thing, being down is not a good thing. So Vemurafenib was a whole lot better. This separation is, is massive, and this image you're looking at is actually iconic, I, I, I believe, in melanoma. What we also learned pretty quickly is that the patterns of responses are very specific. This is also called the swimmer's plot. So this is what you do is these green diamonds tell you when was the first time at which you actually saw the response. And these um, plots essentially show you how long it lasted. So anything that has a narrow at the end of it means that it continues to last for all these months. And anything that doesn't have a narrow means that the response stopped. So when you look at this first, you see that there's a lot of green diamonds really up front, about six weeks into therapy, meaning that the first time you check, the patients have already responded, right? So very quick, profound responses. But the problem is you look at all these arrows and there's not a whole lot of them. So we already knew that by six months, half the patients actually had their tumors grow again. So we made this huge dent, huge impact, but it's only up front and it didn't last very long. And, and soon enough, I think a testament to the huge collaboration that happened in melanoma between pharma, investigators, everybody coming together, we knew that the answer is in the tissue. You know, you had to really get a, a piece of that tissue when the patients progress. And interestingly enough, it's important also to get it early on, right about after two weeks of therapy. But anyway, getting that piece of tissue was so central because we started analyzing those tissues. Why are they progressing? What's different about them from before you started the treatment? And with that, you know, we already have a whole slew of reasons why this happens. Initially, there were about four after one year. We knew there was four mechanisms by which you can actually progress. Now we know there are up to 10, 12, 15 different ways in which the tumor can actually progress. But if you want to group them into kind of categories, I think one simple way of thinking about it is to call them mech dependent, meaning that you know, this is your BRAF and it activates this specific pathway called the MAP kinase pathway. 
and the tumor sees that blocker, that oncogenic, you know, that blocker of the oncogenic driver, struggles with it for six months, but eventually figures a way to bypass it, right? So the way it bypasses it is in 70% of the time is by reactivating the pathway kind of from either below or from above the BRAF, but essentially activating the same pathway that's called MEK dependent. Or, you know, there are a bunch of other pathways that drive tumor cells, so if you activate parallel pathways and things that are unrelated to the MAP kinase pathway, then it doesn't go through this thing called MEK, and so we call it MEK independent. Why is that important? Because we like to drug things when we know that they actually do bad things to patients, right? So if we know that the, act, the, the resistance is happening because of reactivation of something, do we have a drug that can go and target that thing so we can stop the resistance? And so we do. The answer is we have a bunch of drugs. One of them is called MEK inhibitors. And we have also drugs that target the other parallel pathways, PI3 kinase and AKT inhibitors. So being true to our uh, profession of oncology, when one drug works, then two drugs are probably better. So we put two things together, and that's how, you know, the next kind of line of therapies came along, which is to do combination therapies. And the first combination was to say BRAF plus a MEK inhibitor, you know, because 70% of the time it's the MAP kinase pathway, it's the MEK dependent, so if we can inhibit MEK, can we make a dent? And the answer was actually you could, and very quickly so. So this is also one of these iconic images in, in, in uh, melanoma, and I think it's really cool because these curves, these two curves that are on top, I told you being on top is a lot better for this for survival curves. Um, these are actually BRAF plus MEK, two different doses of the MEK inhibitor called trametinib. And the bad arm, remember how it used to be chemotherapy? Now it's already the BRAF inhibitor alone is not good enough. Now it's the one that actually is on the lower side. So, you know, within a, a year and a half, we went from having one drug that beat chemo by a bunch, now that's being beaten by a combination already. So the, again, the pace of progress was very, very fast and very satisfying to us as physicians as much as to you as patients. Um, when you combine two drugs together, you always worry, you know, two drugs are probably gonna cause more toxicity. It so happens that a lot of the toxicity from BRAF is also MEK driven. So if the toxicity is MEK driven and you give a MEK inhibitor, you actually get less toxicity. And that's exactly what happened. We actually saw a lot less toxicity from combining the two drugs, particularly for certain things like skin toxicities. Now, obviously, it's not that clean, so when you put two drugs together, sometimes you get worse toxicity from other things. So there was one thing, for instance, which is fever. People get low-grade, sometimes even high-grade fevers with the one drug. When you put them together, it's actually a little higher, so almost half the patients may get these fever, uh, you know, drug fevers. And then, you know, again, looking at the patterns of responses, I'm going to kind of try to be short here, but essentially, Again, we saw that there's a bit more durability, so instead of six months, now it can last about 10 months. With another combination, it's about 11 months, but it's still half the patient will progress within, you know, still months. So we know that the combination is, is good, gives us a better PFS, but it doesn't really uh, completely cure patients. It doesn't last very long. And so this is Vemurafina plus cobimetanib, so the original drug now with its own MEK inhibitor made by the same company. This is already in phase, finished its phase three trial, and again, the combination looks better than the single agent. So that's actually, if you're looking for what's gonna be approved next, this is gonna be probably the, the next combination to be approved, I think, before the end of this year. So with that, this is kind of where we stand in, in, in targeted therapy. So we know that combination is better. We're trying to understand why people resist combinations, and we're developing other combinations that go after the PI3 kinase pathway. Um, some, things are, some, some combinations are going beyond two drugs into three drugs. So we'll talk about this in a little bit. So what about the other you know, side of the coin? We talked about the tumor cell and how to inhibit the tumor cell. I'm gonna need a lot more than five minutes. So I'm gonna, I'll try to be quick. But um, so, so in terms of immune therapy, 
um, you know, we need to really activate those T cells you heard about that Dr. Kirkwood has been talking about. So interleukin-2 was the first immunotherapy that was approved in the, in the early 90s, in the mid-90s. And it was basically, again, the concept was that those T cells are so important, can we basically increase their numbers, increase their function, kind of, you know, push on the pedal, you know, put the pedal to the metal and try to get them out there to kill tumor cells. And it actually worked. And what you see in these... Um, and, and this curve, you see that, you know, a lot of patients progress pretty quickly and so on, but actually about 25% of patients that don't progress, that respond to that interleukin-2, end up responding for months after months, years after years. And some of them that were originally treated in the 90s are still alive today. So cure, that's as close to the cure as you can be. So even interleukin-2, which we still use to date, and actually one of my patients had promised to show up today, but he didn't. <laughs> but he's, he's had a great response. It's been two and a half years, no issues with, you know, three or four cycles of IL-2. It's still part and parcel of what we do every day because we can cure patients with it. And we knew that since the 90s. What's the problem? Number one, we only cure about 5, 10% at best. So it's not, it's not widely applicable. Two, it's really patients that can handle a lot of toxicity. It's a drug that can only be given in patient that's really akin to giving people sepsis for about five days, literally. And so the toxicity is great, and so we, we can't really, you know, we have to choose our patients very carefully so that we don't harm them with this drug. But the ones that get it, the ones that get the response, do very, very well. That's why the FDA figured, well, we should do this. We should treat patients. So I'll go quickly over CTLA-4. You heard from Dr. Kirkwood how, you know, there's the piece of increasing the number of T cells, increasing their activity, but then when they get into the tumor or around the tumor, they basically just fail. And the reason they fail is because the tumors figure out ways to block them, to decrease their activity, and to make them incapable of actually killing tumor cells. And so, um, simply stated, you know, when, when you have these inhibitory receptors, you know, they basically drop, decrease the activity of the T cell. And so if we can actually block the inhibitory receptors, we will have the T cell activated without anything pulling it back. And so we talked about putting the pedal to the metal. The analogy that's used a lot is that we can basically unleash or, or take our, our foot off the brakes, unleash the immune system, and let it go after melanoma. Well, that works. And that was, again, an iconic image, which is the first time that we saw improvement in overall survival with ipilimumab or anti-CTLA-4. And that drug alone, go with that one-year survival of 25%, you get four doses of this drug. Some patients get only one dose of this drug. And it doubles the one-year overall survival. And it doubles the two years overall survival. And now we know that patients that go on three years without any recurrence can go on for 10 years, again, akin to a cure. So 25% of patients can be cured with this drug alone, which is pretty impressive. Um, the problem with it, again, is that it, it unleashes the immune system both against your tumor and sometimes against yourself. So it can cause a lot of autoimmune toxicity, skin, uh, colitis, which unfortunately ends up being occasionally life-threatening, and we still lose patients to epilimumab no matter how good we try to prevent that. So the, the, we, we know kind of the patterns of toxicity, but to go to PD-1, I can tell you that, you know, PD-1 is kind of the next on the list. It's going to inhibit the, the, the immune checkpoint, unleash the immune system. At least for me, I thought this is going to be kind of a new and improved IP. It'll be a little more effective, probably a little less, less toxic. Good, you know, one step forward. But little did we know that this was actually going to be a huge revolution. It was actually going to be a whole lot more effective than we thought. In fact, the, these, these um, waterfall plots that you see here are actually almost looking like that targeted therapy, that immediate shrinkage of tumor. That's happening with immune therapy. We didn't know that could happen with immune therapy, and that's what we saw with PD-1 antibodies. Almost also 40, 50 percent of patients responding. And then look at this swimmer's plot, right? Forget about the fact that we see the immune response early. Look at all these arrows. That's the whole point. These things last. These responses last for a long period of time. And that's what's really impressive about these drugs. So they work, but I just told you that IPI works too. What about toxicity? 
So they're like, the way I tell it to some of you that have heard it from me is that this drug is three, three times as effective as IPI and essentially three times less toxic. So the, 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 the grade three and four toxicities are less than 10% as opposed to up to you know, 25, 30% for ipilimumab. So this was basically, you know, essentially the holy grail of cancer therapy as, as it stands. And obviously, you know, we pat ourselves on the back in academia a lot and publish things in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is kind of really cool. And then those were single agents, immune therapy, ipi, nivolumab or, or, or pembrolizumab alone, and obviously, again, our instinct is to combine things, but there was actually very good rationale to put IPI plus nivolumab together, and you got even more profound responses, even more complete responses, and that lasts even longer, with the one caveat that this is a, whole, a bit more toxic than IPI alone. In fact, it's almost, you know, 50 to 60 percent of patients can get toxicity. So as we get into these combinations, we can't really predict toxicity very well, and it can be sometimes when it's more toxic. You've seen this slide from Dr. Kirkwood just to tell you that these are only the first step on the way, and, and there's a bunch of other things coming on. Uh, every single one of these inhibitory receptors has, you know, every drug company and, and their brother has maybe six antibodies for it. And then there's also the agonist antibodies, which are, which are important as well. So, um, I'm going to try to cut short because I will listen to Sam. She gave me five minutes about 15 minutes ago. So uh, basically, you know, we think about these drugs. We have them. Now we have to figure out how to work with them. You know, do we, which one do we start first? And there are trials, including one through ecog Akron, which I think is a very seminal trial, that which one should we start first, the combination immunotherapy or the combination chem uh, targeted therapy when the patient comes? If we don't do this trial and prospectively randomize patients and then flip when the patients progress, we won't be able to answer the question. But the good news is we're doing it. Um, how about putting these drugs together? I told you about how excited we all are about combining drugs. And so there, there's a whole bunch of things going on. I'm just going to mention two uh, quick ones. P people tried to combine IPI with vemurafenib, and that was a bit too toxic. So we're thinking about other ways to combine these targeted therapies. In Pittsburgh, we're we, we have at least three trials right now and, and some that are um, coming up soon. One that involves interferon plus vemurafenib, which is led by Dr. Kirkwood and Zarur. Uh, one in which we're combining the satinib with a vaccine, which I know one of the patients that's responding to this trial is in the room, so thank you for participating. Finally, we found something that works that's not a targeted, that's not BRAF targeted and still does a very good job. And then a study in, that I'm leading where we're combining PD-1 plus BRAF inhibitor plus MEK inhibitor, which is going to be started pretty soon. Um, last thing I'm going to say, just because this is my mandate and mission in melanoma, is brain metastases. You know, all these studies I've showed you until now, lots of them, right? Lots of survival curves I showed you. Every single one of them that have brought tremendous progress to melanoma. Every single one of them excludes patients with brain metastases. Well, you would think that's not a big deal. How many patients with brain metastases do we have? Well, how about almost half of them, when they come in the door, have metastatic disease in the brain? Some of them have it only in the brain. And at the time of death, even in the past, up, up to 70% will have it. So it's really incumbent upon us to really bring that, that excitement, those advances that have changed the face of melanoma and the extracranial disease to bring it to patients with brain metastases, which in my opinion are the patients that are the most in need of progress. So we're really working hard on this. Um, uh, the, the targeted therapy actually single agent works. Uh, this is an example where tumors really shrink. We're bringing combinations. We're trying to understand how they get into the brain, how they work in the brain, and um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're on the verge of making that progress, but this is where we stand today. This is Ipinibo for extracranial disease. Remember those curves? It's very positive. It's right outside of that. And this is the drugs that we currently have in the brain. We still have not made the dent we need to make. And so a lot of our work right now is centered on bringing combinations of targeted therapy and immune therapy to patients with brain metastases. I'll end here before I'm chased down with tomatoes, and uh, I'll take any questions you have.